Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future. And by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico. Hello, I'm Lorraine Mills, and welcome to Report from Santa Fe. Our guest today is Dr. Martha Burke. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Well, if I listed all your accomplishments, the show would be half over, but you're a political psychologist, an author of one of my favorite political books, Your Voice, Your Vote, and what's the subtitle? The Savvy Woman's Guide to Power, Politics, and the Change We Need. Well, we, this is so perfect for this year. You're also a women's equity expert. You're the money editor for Ms. Magazine. You're a co-founder of Ms. Magazine. You blog on Huffington Post. You're on TV shows all the time as an expert. I love your radio show. It's called Equal Time. It's actually out of one of our Santa Fe NPR stations, right? Right, KSFR. You are the former chair of the National Council on Women's Organizations. That's a lot of organizations. And you co-founded the Center for advancement of public policy. But I think people know for you and your connection to golf. Oh, yes. Would you tell us, remind us of the historical event? Well, just very briefly, uh, and it may be relevant to some of our conversation Mm -hmm. today. Uh, I challenged, as head of the National Council of Women's Organizations, I did challenge the Augusta National Golf Club to open to women. And you would have thought that I challenged them to all go home and wash dishes and never come out of their houses again uh, because it causes huge explosion in the media that lasted over a year. And it was over golf, for heaven's sake, just letting women play golf at a golf course. So that was around 2003. It was. And it was quite a scandal. It was one of the early feminist actions. It was quite a scandal and we did not succeed that year in getting the club to open. Uh, So we did it another way. Uh, We went through the legal system and we sued a couple of the members who uh, were heads of large corporations such as Smith Barney and Morgan Stanley uh, for sex discrimination in the workplace because we were hearing from women that work for them and so they said golf is nothing you should work here it's terrible. So we sued those two companies in behalf of the women, and we collected for the women $80 million in settlements. Uh. So that was the price of playing golf, and the boys decided that was a long list, and the rest of them might get sued too, so maybe they better open up. They did, but to date they've only let in three women, so it's a slow go even now. It reminds me that when Nixon was running for higher office, one of the things he was attacked with was belonging to a men only and white only golf course, mm-hmm. golf club. And he said, no, no, you don't understand. I'm working to change it from the inside. Oh, yes, of <laughs> course he was. Well, by about 2000, he hadn't changed it yet. And that club was called the Congressional. It's in Washington, D.C. And they chose to give up in all of their tax benefits they were getting from the state of Maryland. Uh, so they could continue to bar women, and they do so to this day. Mm. Well, you are still involved in the golf issue. Talk to me about the Women's Open in 2017. The Women's Open in 2017, and this came to my attention from a group of African-American male golfers who are not professionals, but they're well-regarded professional men who play golf. And they called and said, did you know the Women's Open is being played at a Trump club in 2017? And this was long before the infamous tape that just came out. This was over racism. And they said, we think that they should pull out because Trump is such a racist. And could you help us get some publicity? And we were able to get some good publicity for it. A decision has not been made to move it yet, but I just got a call a couple of days ago from, uh, I believe it was ESPN, one of the sports networks, and they're going to be reporting on it as well and putting a little pressure now because of these misogynist Mm -hmm. tapes. So uh, Trump is benefiting from women's labor in this case, uh, very handsomely, 
and uh, the African-American golfers and I'm sure uh, other golfers of goodwill feel like that's the wrong thing to do. Well, uh, one of the reasons I asked you here is that uh, we have a very historic presidential race here, the first woman presidential candidate trying to break the final glass ceiling, and uh, Donald Trump. So I would love for us to look at the presidential race instead of in, in terms of gender issues. So we know that one's a Democrat, one's a Republican. That's not what we're doing here. We're talking about that one is a man and one is a woman. One is a man that, that has proven to be very misogynistic and sexist, racist, all of that. And, um, and Hillary just, you know, she's being herself and trying to represent women and women's issues. So before we get into the whole misogyny thing, let's look at some of their proposals in terms of just policy, um, in terms of um, maternity leave, in terms of child care, in terms of uh, edu further education for women. Can you uh, uh, approach some of those issues? Absolutely, absolutely. I think uh, you have hit on the first thing you mentioned there in that list is maternity leave. And here is the difference in a woman that understands policy very deeply as it affects women and a man who doesn't. Uh, Trump has proposed six weeks of paid maternity leave. Uh, if he is elected, to put that in as a national requirement for employers. Usually these things are large employers, at least 50, sometimes 100. So it wouldn't help uh, people that work for the very small companies, but it is maternity leave. Clinton says correctly, no, we cannot give the benefit only to women. First of all, it's not fair to men. It's not fair to dads. It's not fair to people who adopt a child rather than have one uh, through procreation. And, but more, going beyond that, what is the consequence of that in the workplace? Well, the employer may be thinking, as that young woman comes out of college alongside that young man, maybe I better just hire him because she may need maternity leave. And if it's not open to men but only women, that's a barrier. Maybe the woman does get hired anyway. Along comes a promotion. Well, gee, what if she gets pregnant? We better not give her the promotion. So it has consequences that I'm sorry to say Mr. Trump has not thought through. That's just one of the things. Um, and then actual child care. Actual child care, Trump has proposed uh, giving a tax deduction for quote unquote, the average cost of child care. Well, first of all, he doesn't apparently know that we now have a tax credit for child care up to a certain amount. There is a vast difference in a tax deduction, which he's proposing, and a tax credit, which is already something that's been in force for quite a number of years. A tax credit comes off of your bottom line tax bill, whether or not you itemize. But a tax deduction is only good if you itemize. So rich women like Ivanka Trump, his daughter, who he says he's going to put in charge of child care, uh, they can presumably deduct the cost of that stay-at-home nanny. Uh, but low-income women uh, who do not uh, pay taxes because they're too poor to pay taxes, they actually will not benefit at all. And who are those low-income women? I just have to throw this in because there's another difference in the two candidates. Uh, the majority of minimum wage workers in the United States are adult women. Trump says we don't need a raise. We, we just don't need it. If people make enough. Uh, Hillary Clinton wants to raise it to $12 an hour from the present $7.25, not as much as her primary opponent, Bernie Sanders, wanted 15 The unions are fighting for 15 but she does see the need to raise it, and she sees the effect on low-income women and their kids. Um, are there other economic issues related to gender in the two policies? Well, yeah, let's just talk about two of the Republicans' greatest hits, <laughs> <laughs> always, always. One is uh, lowering taxes. 
and Trump says he's going to lower the individual tax rate from 39 to 33 percent. That's going to help women and men, but the women it's going to help are women that make over $413,000 a year. Uh, It's going to give them a tax break. uh, Those women way down at the bottom, once again, uh, they qualify for the earned income tax credit. That means a sort of a a reverse tax because they're too poor to really pay taxes. If, If candidates want to do something for women, they need to do something about payroll taxes that everybody pays, and they're highly regressive on low-income workers, women and men. So that that's one thing. Another perennial, perennial of the platform, and certainly front and center for Trump, is he wants to repeal Obamacare. Mm-hmm. That will have a disproportionate effect on women, because what goes away if Obamacare goes away? Maternity coverage goes away. Mammograms without copays goes away. Birth control without copays goes away. And what comes back? Gender rated pricing. Uh. Insurance companies could and did before Obamacare say to you, Laureen, you're a woman, I'm going to charge you more for the same coverage as the guy next to you merely because you're a woman. And it didn't have anything to do with maternity coverage because they could say, and by the way, we don't cover maternity anyway. Mm. All of that changes if Obamacare goes away. Has anyone said what, if it did, what are they going to replace it with? Well, we don't quite know yet. No. no. So... Uh, Just as an aside, uh, Clinton does uh, acknowledge that there are still some problems with Obamacare, and she does want to make some changes. But she doesn't want to take away all of those benefits that disproportionately affected women when it came in, and men too, because so many more million people now have insurance. And another factor that applies to both genders is they can't, the insurance companies cannot deny care because of pre- existing conditions because in a way being a woman was a pre-existing condition being a, and one of the senators <laughs> said that she said with what you guys want this is when they were arguing about it in the senate uh, and by the way all the women voted for maternity and birth control coverage in obamacare and some of the men voted against it even the democrats so it was a bipartisan we don't need that it's just a woman's Uh, benefit. But you're absolutely right. Uh, Those are the kinds of things that candidates really ought to be thinking about, and some of them don't think it all the way through. Uh, We're speaking today with Dr. Martha Burke, who is a political psychologist and the author of Your Voice, Your Vote. And we're going to move into a little of the the high weeds here, because some of the remarks that, that the Republican candidate has been saying have been very offensive to a lot of people. And I think one of the highlights of this whole political campaign is Michelle Obama's response to the hot mic comments that we won't mention here that Donald Trump had mentioned on the bus with Billy Bush. And she, uh, can you speak to her remarks? And I, I hope. If there's anyone watching who hasn't seen it, you can Google it. She did it in New Hampshire last week, and it's one of the best political speeches, certainly, of the season. Uh, Best political speech at least of the decade, if not longer. It was amazing. And I came away thinking, that's our next female president. I really did. But there were two themes that went through the, the speech was against misogyny in general, which, by the way, is mostly coming from men, but not all. There are a few women misogynists, and it's certainly not partisan. Uh, they're misogynists in each party or every party, I should say. I don't want to take you off your train of thought, but we better de- define misogyny. Well, it's a hatred of women, basically, okay. yeah. uh, and, and, and woman blaming uh, is a big part of it. Uh, in the sexual assault arena, it usually comes out as she asked for it or she's lying or mm-hmm. both. Uh, but But Obama had outrage and hurt. And it was real. It was not put on. It was not just words. It was felt from the heart. You could tell it. It it just resonated. And 
I think any woman watching that, whether they want to believe it or not or want to admit it or not, let's say admit it, because most women know, they know what she was talking about. You're walking down the street. I don't care if you're even my age, you get checked out. Uh, if you're younger, it's worse than that. You get cat calls sometime reaching out for you, that sort of thing. It is a sense of entitlement that many men have over access to women and women's bodies. And that is where the outrage came in. I could see it so clearly. My children are grown men now, of course, are both guys. But she has two daughters. The hurt, the outrage must be so much more for moms and dads that have girls that are having to listen to this and endure it psychologically. And the the indignation in her voice and, and when she recounted things that had happened to her, well, it just opened up so many people's hearts and memories. I know that Joan Baez wrote her a wonderful letter saying, oh, I kind of pushed all that stuff down. Even the radio broadcaster Diane Ream said, oh my goodness. And so I'm hoping now that it is like picking off a scab to heal the wound, but I think it's really time to try to heal that wound. And, and let us just say that misogyny and blaming women and belittling women is not really a, a, a party thing. Both parties no. need to address this. It's really about power. It and, is and, about and, power. And, and, and domination. And so... And, and let's not forget entitlement. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, something going back to the speech that my husband said, I, I hadn't thought of it in these terms. I had the gender lens on. But he said, put the racial lens on this. Yes. For Michelle Obama, I am sure it, it evoked slavery and the slave days when whites had dominion over blacks to the point where they could do anything they wanted to. And that may have been feeding some of the outrage, appropriately so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so as a, there's been a lot of polling about uh, the man, male vote versus the, the women's vote. And probably the most striking is Nate Silver, who's famous for his polling site, 538, has some maps, if you go to that website, of what the state by state, what the map would look like if only men voted and if only women voted. Do you want to do, I, I, we, neither, we haven't memorized it, but some things really come to mind. Well, yes. Uh, the, first of all, for the audience, let me say that the gender gap, which means the difference in how women and men vote, has been with us since 1980, since Ronald Reagan ran for president. Uh, the Equal Rights Amendment was up for renewal, if you, or the, the push for it, I should say. It, it was much in the, the conversation that year. And it was the first year that women voted in appreciably, demonstrably different ways than men did, and it's been with us ever since. Women have been more democratic in their votes. Uh, they register as Democrats in higher numbers and vote for the Democratic candidate. He and I use the word advisedly, hasn't always won, but he has always won with women since 1980. Well, what Nate Silver found in the uh, piece you're referring to is that if only women voted, Hillary would win by a huge landslide. And if only men voted, Trump would win by lesser of a landslide, but substantially he would win. Now, for us sitting at this table, I think one of the interesting points was there weren't too many states that would go for Hillary if only men voted, uh, mostly the West Coast and the Northeast. Exception, New Mexico. So even if only men voted, uh, Hillary would still be elected in, in this state. So in the delightful way that our social media reacts to things, Someone came up with a hashtag that says, repeal the 19th. The 19th Amendment is what gave women the right to vote. And so uh, what they want to do is uh, repeal so that women can't vote. But a lot of some of our greatest writers have responded to this. Margaret Atwood, who wrote a book called The Handmaid's Tale, very prophetic about how women might be treated in the future, she addressed repeal the 19th. She's not for it. And... Um, 
and Elizabeth Colbert, who won the 2015 Pulitzer Prize for her book, The Sixth Extinction, she wrote a very clever piece called A Modest Proposal, based on Jonathan Swift's modest proposal, just saying, no, 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 we'll deny men the vote. And it's all, it's tongue in cheek, but it does bring up that, the same old rivalry again. Well, it is so interesting because the polls are now showing, pollsters ask men, uh, do you feel discriminated against? And 30 some odd percent uh, uh, by, uh, discriminate on the basis of your gender. Uh, and 30 some odd percent said, yeah, I do. And, and 60 percent said, well, yeah, I do a little bit. And they correlated that with who did they support for president. Mm. And of course, it correlates very strongly uh, with support for Donald Trump. He has engendered a lot of basically mythology. Uh, that men are being discriminated against and women are getting all the goodies. And one of the things that Colbert said in her piece, which I thought was great, is she says, let's just suppose you want to talk about uh, the power that men have had just in government. No, never mind corporations where 90 percent of the CEOs are uh, men. But she says, just in government, let's suppose that Hillary wins and she is in for one term and that every president following her is female and serves only one term, it will still take until 2192 for women to catch up with men and the number that have served as president of the United States. So if you think we're taking over, think yeah, again. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I think we are poised to witness this incredible cultural shift. Things have been changing very quickly. The way gay marriage went from not you know, being acceptable to suddenly being in all states and, and um, uh, medical marijuana and perhaps decriminalization of marijuana, these things are happening. And although what's called the Trump effect um, and the misogyny and sexable, sexism, I think this is really a teachable moment. I think that we can finally step up. One thing that comes to mind after the remarks, one, uh, I think it was a reporter, a writer online said, well, just tweet me your stories of sexual assault. And one day she had 27,000. They were anonymous. They just described what happened. And so that the men, the women who read it, they all, it made them remember things that had happened to them because it's probably happened to every woman. But the men who were reading it said, they just rub their eyes in disbelief. Has this been going on? And the women say, yes, we have to look around us all the time when we're on the street. Absolutely. And, 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 and you wouldn't. I used to walk when I lived in D.C. and I had to walk home late at night. I walked in the middle of the street. Hmm. I didn't dare walk on the sidewalk. And I, I doubt if very many men would think, gee, I better get out in the middle of the street. But what struck me about... The, that hashtag, and it was on Twitter, it was send me your your first assault. Yeah. And it was shocking to me girls. how many of these things happened to kids 10, 11, 12 years old. Their first assault being grabbed in the privates by grown men. Some, they all, uh, or most of them, described it as old men. Well, to a 10 year old, somebody yeah. 21 or two, but it was probably a range of guys from younger men to quite older men, and they felt entitled uh, to grab these young kids that way. So we only have a couple of minutes left. How can we um, use this as a teachable moment? So the the whole thing about misogyny, hating women and belittling women and, and sexual assault is on the table now. We can't let it be swept aside for another 50 years. This is the time, but what can we do? Well, I think we can. younger women can take the lead and are taking the lead because of, for example, the Stanford rape that happened uh. and the guy got some slap on the wrist uh, in social media. I think that. But I think we have to somehow in our heads, and I, I would ask men and women, and by the way, uh, there's so many men of goodwill that, yes. that hate this stuff too. Uh, so I don't want to say it's all men. It certainly it is not. And they fear for the example for their sons. But if we reverse our head and think sometime, what if Hillary Clinton had assaulted 16 men? 
What if she didn't know the difference in one tax policy or the other? What if she didn't know where Aleppo was? And just sort of turn the tables, it gives us an insight into how we think about the competence and the value of women versus men in our society. Is this gonna be a breakthrough if we have our first woman president? And I might add, it would be even if she were a Republican, it would be a huge breakthrough. Is it going to be the hardest and, and toughest glass ceiling? Absolutely. I think it'll be a big step for our country, but we have to start thinking differently about the role of women and men. Even women have been taught that we we don't quite have it or we have to be better and we do because the men the pay gap's an example of that by the way uh, mr trump said he did think women should get paid equally uh than as men for comparable jobs but he said then he followed it by saying you know it's hard to know what kind of jobs are comparable and if you say people have to be treated equally you're giving up the american dream what i rest my case yeah <laughs> yeah well um as we talk about these things and again i want to emphasize that it's really about power and not party and it is that indeed. there's things that that parents and men of goodwill and women of goodwill this is our chance now to step up and make these changes the old line about ginger rogers did everything fred astaire did but backwards and in high heels right. it's time for us to appreciate you know how how much women offer us and how hard we work absolutely and and i do want to just in, in closing say and so many Republican leaders have now come out against all of this misogyny and, and really the, the hatred of women that, that you're seeing now on the signs even uh, at, at the rallies and so forth. Uh, those folks uh, are stepping up. And I hope they will continue to along with the rank and file. And maybe we can turn a corner. Well, I do hope so. But I'm so happy that you have come to discuss this with me. This is a very important issue for me. Our guest today is Dr. Martha Burke. And you can find out more about the Savvy Women's Guide to Power, Politics, and the Change We Need in her book, Your Voice, Your Vote. And I'm Lorene Mills. I'd like to thank you, our audience, for being with us today on Report from Santa Fe. We'll see you next week. Past archival programs of Report from Santa Fe are available at the website reportfromsantafe.com. If you have questions or comments, please email info at reportfromsantafe.com. Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future. And by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico.